Okay, so uh, <laughs> please join me uh, in welcoming our speaker for tonight. Uh, Evan is going to be talking about celebrating 10 years of Elm, looking back, fun old stories and experiences that guide the next decade. So please join me in welcoming Evan. Thank you, Evan. Hey. So now I have to share a screen. Do it seems like it worked. Perfect. Yeah, so I set up a Prezi because that's what I always do, you know. Um, but it's a little bit of a casually set up thing. Um, but I just wanted to go back and think of some like fun stuff throughout the years and maybe tell some stories that not everyone might have heard and then talk a little bit about the next 10 years. Um, so yeah, so as I was thinking of stories and like going back through things, I, I got like three, had three, not eras, because there is an overlap between them, but like three groupings. So the first is this uh, era of youthful exuberance. And I, I Googled uh, what exuberance is exactly. And it's really the perfect word, joyously unrestrained and enthusiastic. And I went back through the old um, Google groups from you know the very beginning to see like what we were talking about. Cause I remembered that time very fondly and I found some interesting conversations. So here's one, uh, uh, July 20th, 2012. So I had just gotten out of university. I had just finished my senior thesis and it was summer. So I hadn't started my job. So I was probably like at home in Texas, like being very hot. Um, and I was, and here, this is just like how things were at the time. In the initial implementation, um, there was no int and float distinction because I was like, well, that's what JavaScript has. And I am like, perhaps foolishly, I made some changes to uh, separate ints and floats, but it seems like uh, it appears JavaScript does not have any way to do in integer arithmetic. I just, it is, I didn't know that, um, but I'd made the change, I'd done the commits, and uh, there weren't any big complaints. So people, so I was like, okay. Um, another one is the string representation. So this, this story stuck with me for a long time. Um, so this is more than a year later. You know, people were experimenting with Elm a little bit. And um, I'm just like, hey, what if we change the representation of strings? We currently say a string is equal to a list of characters. And I guess at this time, I don't know if this is true, but maybe we did have that type syntax. I don't know. Um, but I'm like, yeah, it's nice and cool, but it's also not very practical. And I go into the downside to this approach, we have a little conversation, you know, I remember John and Laszlo and Max, and we talk about it a little bit and it's like, okay, this seems relatively uncontroversial. I'll just do it tonight. Um, and so that's what happened, we changed it. Um, so there's some other, oh yeah, so type inference is a funny one. So I don't know how many people remember this, but there was a time when type inference just didn't, uh, it like didn't work very well. There's this odd thing in um, all the like literature and documentation about type inference is that it's either for research, in which case they assume you know how to do a practical and efficient implementation or it's for explanatory purposes, in which case they assume that you don't really need to do a practical and efficient implementation. But there's no third category where they tell you how to do a practical and efficient implementation. So uh, in the early years, we were su suffering from that. So there's some, uh, in retrospect, kind of funny uh, conversations. So. I found this one early 2013. 
And uh, I'm just saying, hey, what kind of type annotation should we have? So I didn't remember this, but apparently there just weren't type annotations at first. Um, and we're just like comparing different um, ML family languages and what syntax they use. And you can see the old signals and elements if anybody was around in the old times for my thesis and uh, you know, before LMUI <laughs> actually got it right, you know, I took an effort before that. It didn't work out. Um, but we talked about it a little bit and we said, okay, the um, the Haskell version looks cool, but we'll switch to operators. And this one was the funny one that I found. Uh, I took a pass at adding type annotations. It works but I need to take another pass um, to use the info to speed up the type checker. Um, it should be a way to bypass whatever sort of slowdowns are currently lurking in there. Mm, there were more slowdowns, but optimistic. Um, I also started on type aliases, but I was watching British quiz shows at the same time, so things went a little slower than normal. Um, so yeah, so this, I believe this would have been I was working specifically out of my day job. So it was just like for fun. And I am pretty sure that that would have been the quiz show QI, if you're familiar. It's a great one. Um, but yeah, there's a couple other type annotations. So, okay, so I added type annotations. And Jeff, I think, yeah, he built from, I think he built from source because this project was taking 10 minutes to compile. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and maybe this is the one where it comes out. So he's got the new version working and where does he say it? Okay, so he, it took 45 minutes to compile. But after adding the type annotations, it went down to 18 seconds. So I don't know. I just think there's something about seeing the that this all happens in the course of like three, four days, the February 3rd, uh, and then February 7th, 8th, we're like working through these building from source. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting just to sort of put in perspective one of the things that's been a long-term um, thing I've been working on for many, many years is like how to get performance really good. And it's sort of funny to look back and see where we started, you know, people are writing, you know, maybe a thousand lines of code and it took like 40 minutes or 10 minutes or, um, and just for me personally, it's cool to think about, 10 years of learning Haskell. And to my wife and I would joke, I have bit mania, where like the level of detail that I get into these days to for a performance boost. Another one is just the maybe, um, just a fun discussion, I guess, where I'm like, hey, you know, we've been using the name maybe with just a nothing, but are those good names? And so it's like, maybe it should be optional or maybe it should be an option. Or I think someone suggested just having it be a question mark and a bunch of people weigh in, we all talk through it. Um, and we decide against doing that. But I think this is interesting because for me, this was a really special time in Elm where you just throw things out, people would discuss it, you'd weigh all the different sides. And then it's like, well, we'll do this. And things just went along. Um, so, okay, so that's that's kind of like the early days. I'm watching quiz shows. I'm adding type inference or <laughs> that actually works. Um, the next phase I would say is like developing a distinct style and in the, Earlier days, I was quicker to add things, just enthusiastic about stuff. 
Um, and so in this phase, I was trying to describe, like I, I have a subtitle for each of these sections. So just for fun, I was looking for one and the Scandinavian minimalism actually kind of captured the style in a surprising way. Um, I found a little description of it. It's about combining simplicity, comfort, and practicality. It's about making your home beautiful, but also practical and convenient. Um, built their efforts around functionality and modernism with a desire to democratize design and allow everyone to have a stunning home. So I don't know, I, I just sort of resonated with that. And by coincidence, I live in uh, Denmark now. And uh, I, I don't know if it's such a coincidence when I really look back at everything. But um, uh, in terms of this distinct style, um, one of the places where it sort of got laid out was in this talk I did, Let's Be Mainstream. Um, and I imagine some of you have seen it, but I wanted to just go through some parts that I thought are fun in retrospect. I was looking back through it. So I had this history of programming, and I go through it and, you know, I tell some jokes about it. Um, and I ask sort of where, what comes next? You know, you have these arrows and maybe it's functional. Maybe it's stack based. Maybe it's prologue. Maybe it's types. Maybe it's gradual types. So I think it's just kind of fun to look back. At, I think this is 2015 and see it like, okay, you know, we're, I'm sort of laying out. What are the possible futures here? Um, and then another fun thing from this talk is sort of, I was talking about how JavaScript wants to get to this nice gradual types to improve maintainability. And then, you know, well, along with some jokes, you know, I make the point that the goal is to get to this even higher level of maintainability from JavaScript. And I think this talk um, had some elements that, you know, I'm starting to, in having a more clear vision of like, hey, I want to do these things that's separate from the historical lineage that Elm comes from, you know, like part of this was drawing this there and then crossing it out. Like, that's not what I want to do. I want to do this other thing. And so I think that was, um, you know, not everyone who might have been interested in Elm at the time liked that vibe. Um, so another step on this developing a distinct style was um, taking out signals entirely. So one way to look at this is like, hey, Elm got a lot easier and that's how it was presented. And, but another way, like kind of how I look at it is I did all this work on my thesis and the part about um, uh, rendering didn't work out. We ultimately went with HTML. Um, and then the part about signals also didn't work out. So with this release, my thesis like no longer had any direct relationship to Elm, except like a historical. That's like, I don't know how much syntax from it would exactly match either. Um, but again, this was sort of in shooting for like, how can we simplify? How can we trim out and get the simplest, most cohesive thing? Um, it's not always the most popular thing to do. And then this sort of developed into more of a, um, we started asking, would this be added today? We were started looking at features and saying, okay, if we, if someone proposed today having the list range as built in syntax, would it get added? And it's like, well, of course it wouldn't. That's not, that's not like what Elm wants. It's like, I might think it's kind of nice or in some context, but here it's not right. So I wanted to um, have an example of would this be added today? Not always being the most 
popular. So in this phase of uh, stuff, I also was maybe not as uh, jovial online always. I tried, but sometimes I'd get a little frustrated. And so I remember one in particular. Um, I was in the same style as I would have done in 2013. I was like, hey, I'm thinking of what are the costs or like pluses and minuses of this kind of stuff. And I'm getting into like, oh, like in Futura, there's these concepts of what shapes are beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And ultimately it becomes an argument about, you know, is it right to try to simplify and keep these, you know, eventually should the symbols rely on the cultural meanings that they already have, or are symbols just a symbol, you learn what it means and it's no problem. And I was saying, you know, it, the cultural context is important, the historical meaning, you know, plus makes more sense as an operator than a dollar sign or et cetera. But on the other side is, well, you just learn the symbol. And I got a little frustrated and I sent a message in ASCII and said, if it's not clear, you can look it up really easily. And once you learn the codes, you can use it in all your emails. And then we can all write emails in hex and wonder why people feel alienated. Um, so not my best moment. Um, and I think that sort of is a part of this phase is like, on the one hand, really believing in the style. And on the other hand, you know, being really wrapped up emotionally in bringing people along you know like yeah like uh or or i don't know being being hard to see people who are disappointed with the uh direction um so the next phase i'd broadly call understanding the limits so when there's nothing left to remove, what do you do? Um, and I broke this into two sort of overall categories, organizational and personal. So one thing that was true sort of throughout, maybe since 2014, was that there's a lot of different things to work on. So there's the compiler, there's packages, there's infrastructure, there's actually doing releases. You know, if some of you have like someone at work who's specifically managing releases to make sure everything goes smoothly. There's Twitter, there's blogs, there's talks, there's GitHub, there's forums, there's conferences, there's outreach, there's trademarks, there's accounting, there's taxes. And as a person working on this project, I always tried to just like, I wouldn't say I tried to do all these things. It was more that I didn't know. I didn't know. I don't know if I didn't know. I didn't accept that there were limits. You know, I, uh, when, when something was wrong, I just like, try, I just put more pressure to go faster or to try out just. And also because I didn't know I, I wasn't able to make that limit for myself. I wasn't able to com communicate my limits uh, to other people very well. So in this later phase, I started to realize like, okay, like many of the other programming languages out there have bigger budgets and more staff. And so they might hire a person specifically called developer relations that handles all these online communication jobs. And they'll have a whole nother job for engineering. Um, and depending on the size of the team, that DevRel job may sort of be split, but like it may be a small cost on all engineers or it may be a dedicated person. Um, I don't know what to call this, but someone's got to do these things. Um, and we've been lucky to have uh, great volunteers run conferences. But some of these things, it's just like I have to do behind the scenes. So like with trademark stuff, you know, you just have to find a lawyer 
and you know they tell you hey it's this many hundred dollars an hour and you say okay <laughs> let's do it you know um so there's the organizational side and i would say in the the yeah this this phase is, was a lot about like understanding how these all fit together and figuring out like what how do i work in such a way that more of these things can be done so yeah so another thing to talk about here is through the years there's been a lot of people who've worked on elm for all sorts of reasons you know maybe it's fun um maybe they have some extra free time and all these things align such that people end up making packages or tools or but so over time things might not align as as much um, and maybe people are married or things at work are stressful and it becomes tough to keep up that same level of work so one way i start to think about it for volunteers is you know these are jobs that are difficult in their own right and you know at, at if you're at a tech firm you know there's a whole person dedicated to that who like needs a break at the end of the day and to think of being able to do these kinds of jobs year over year just in your free time and not have it take some toll on your personal life or your health or um i just don't think it's realistic to do the jobs here at without getting burnt out over time. So I think that kind of connects to the personal. I have a few stories here. So this one's funny. So at that conference where I did Let's Be Mainstream, there was also a talk from the person who created um, C++, who is Danish, by chance. Um, not everyone's into Scandinavian minimalism, you know? Um, and I went into the talk having sort of the typical view of C and C++ is like, oh, it's an, oh, it, ooh, ooh. You know, people just sort of say things about it that aren't the most favorable. And he did this talk, which I found really, really enlightening and uh, where he just was like, this was the situation. These were our goals. You know, everyone was using C. We wanted to add these new abilities uh you know everyone said object oriented oh it's too complicated it's too fancy you know only the super elite university people can ever use it um and he sort of lays out his goals you know and if you have those goals he then makes the case that the answer is c plus plus and I don't know, I, I found it really cool because I like to evaluate a programming language based on its goals, as opposed to based on what I want it to be or what I want from a programming language. Um, and that's like more fair to the authors. And I think it can make you um, more appreciative of different languages as well. Like one of these that's like this is PHP is like, people use it it's like that means they like something about it and one way to look at it is like oh i don't like it but another is why is it so useful like what is it about that and can i learn a lesson here anyway he gives this talk i'm really impressed and afterwards people are asking questions and it's like young guys who are maybe in college maybe just getting out of college and it's like, you know, how come you're not doing it like in Rust? And as an audience member, I just was so mad. I was like, this guy just gave a whole talk about why everything is the way it is. And it's like massively used. And the foundation of these new languages that are coming out are like in conversation with that track record of work. And, you know, I'd been so dedicated to my, um, um you know i need to produce more i need to produce faster i saw him answering this question i was like if i get to be his age and all i've done in my life is made elm and there's 23 year olds being like why don't you do it like in a way that doesn't suck 
like this language that's based on you. And it's just like, I was like, I got to change my life up. Like, I can't. <laughs> I have to have a more full life. Um, so around that time, like, I started exercising. I started cooking. I went from, like, not being able to do a pull-up to being able to do a muscle-up. It was really, really a uh, transformative moment um, in my life with, uh, with this project. Oh, yeah, this was another thing. So since, like, 18 and 19, I've been asking people, like, hey, like, you know, I have this idea for making tests faster and integrated in this or that way or doing this project to make this faster or da, da, da. And I just kept hearing, yeah, I mean, our Elm is actually fine. Like, we have this Ruby backend that's a mess. We have this Python backend. Or we have this TypeScript backend that's a mess. Or, and, uh, you know, I also had just spent, like, um, a lot of time. Yeah, this was another thing. Is um, You can see if you look at the history of releases, the rate. Um, I was able to keep a pretty insane rate up. Um, but once the, you know, what can we remove? It got to a certain point. It's like, well, we kind of removed the stuff we wanted to remove. There's not, it's not clear that things should be added necessarily. So I was really focusing on how do we get the smallest assets in the industry? Um, and you'll notice faster builds were on both of these. And I still am not satisfied with the speed of the builds. So someday I'll get to write up and be proud of it, but I'm still like annoyed by certain things. But the point is just that the releases took a lot longer because you can't do a quick like, oh, here's a syntax changer. Oh, here's a little tweak. It's like, hey, we need to revamp like the compiler. <laughs> if we really want to make a difference on this kind of error message or this kind of performance thing or this aspect of asset size. Um, so yeah, so personally, I, I was struggling with this feeling of, I got into Elm um, because, you know, I was excited about functional programming. I was excited about making it simple and beautiful. And I got into this mode where I was like, I'm just like optimizing bit payloads so that Google's happy and they can like serve pages faster and they've proved that that's worth some millions of dollars per millisecond. And I felt like I'd somehow gone from this creative work to sort of this, I don't know, like I, I didn't feel that I could make something exciting if I kept with that way of looking at the project. So that brings us to the next 10 years where I wanted to sort of learn from this whole experience. You know, I want to keep that excitement from the very beginning. I want to keep that distinct style that's about beautiful, simple designs. And I want to be realistic about my personal limits, about organizational limits, and try to take those lessons and do a better job. So I set up some personal goals. So one is make programming fun and easy. Uh, second is the quality of my work correlates with financial sustainability. So that was something that I didn't mention in the talk, but it was something that I struggled with. And I've, I've talked about it in public a little bit. It's just that because I was in these patronage relationships, it wasn't always clear that if I made a really great if I did really great compiler work, it wasn't clear that I had any relationship to my continue, like my continuing to have a job. Um, and it turned out that ultimately my continuing a job, I think had to do more with like VC rounds and VC guys coming in and saying like, so who here can we, how can we raise our uh, profits? You know, uh, you know, and, uh, not everyone sticks around, and uh, I don't know. So, so personally, I had this feeling of 
you know, I feel like I'm an engineer. I feel like I'm contributing. But at the end of the day, the person who's paying the bills is like, well, he's just doing this stuff for free and he'd do it whether he was here or not. And I don't know, that was really stressful. Um, and the other one is to be useful for people outside of venture capital, Silicon Valley. Um, so I'm thinking of like students, scientists, um, people who want to make a website who are just getting into programming for the first time, indie firms, like just trying to have a spirit outside of like big tech. Um, and so I want to set this up sort of in three parts organizationally. So one is Elm, like normal. There's the compiler packages, everything else. That's what I'm working on. The second part is Elm Studio. So this is, uh, the idea is to make it really easy to host an Elm website. Um, so yeah, so these groups are talking maybe students, maybe hobbyists, artists. In the spirit of Elm, can just make a website and they get these nice error messages and the website's actually on the internet. Um, and so my wife, Teresa, has been uh, working on this. And the hope is that if this works out, you know, uh, we'll see, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, suddenly we'd be in a situation where the easier it is to use Elm, the more financially sustainable the work on Elm becomes. So if someone can just say, hey, I want a website and they have it, now we can keep working on the compiler packages, et cetera. And if it goes well enough, we can start thinking of like, oh, maybe we actually can support all those other jobs that I mentioned in the organization uh, section of like, so that people who are excited about Elm and have done great work, like don't have to do it at the expense of things in their life, like their personal, their family or whatever else. So just to, so people know, my wife is on um, parental leave at the moment. So it's not, uh, and we're doing it in the Danish style. So there's very generous uh, maternity leave here. Um, but that's the plan, just to give a idea. Um, and then the third part is Elm Foundation. So I set this up in like 2016, um, partly because I often look to Python for how things are set up, and they have a really nicely set up foundation. Um, and my goal for Elm Foundation, assuming we have capacity to do something with it someday, is to support Elm Bridge and conferences and have it be about community and, you know, we can help someone with tickets to a conference or we can help get food or transportation for something. I think that'd be a really cool thing. Um, and from a personal perspective, I, I feel somewhat conflicted about having set up a nonprofit organization because um, I think the laws in the U.S. are maybe a little too... Uh, relaxed. Um, so I try to, you know, I, because of I, the experiences I had with the, my, you know, arguing for the value of my own work in companies, I don't think of my work as a volunteer thing. You know, if I wanted to do charitable work, I don't, I wouldn't categorize working on a compiler as a charity. You know? uh, so I kind of joke sometimes that like, if you had to explain to Jesus what your charity was and he doesn't get it, it's like maybe there's something off about it. And it's like, okay, look, so we, we make the compiler. It's written in Haskell, it's ex, you know? And he's like, wait, wait, wait. So the compiler, the poor. Uh, um, but yeah, so the point is like, to the extent that this foundation that it's up that gets used, I want it to be for something that can at least plausibly be connected to something that's uh, of a charitable character. Um, but yeah, so that's where I, I want to give like a high level view of the organizational goals for the next 10 years. I want to keep that 
excitement in my work on Elm. I'm really excited for Teresa's work on Elm Studio. And um, hopefully all these lessons will make it so that we can continue the work in a way that's personally sustainable, financially sustainable, all these nice things. So, yeah. All right, fantastic. Please uh, join me in thanking Evan for his talk. Thank you, Evan. Okay, we have a metric boatload of people. Um, so I normally just get people to dive in, but maybe this time around, uh, let's try uh, use Google's uh, raise hand uh, functionality for any questions. So uh, I will just try and moderate from the top level. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I couldn't see the chat or anything, so it was like hard to get a vibe on if I was bombing at any point. So I, I apologize if it was weird or uh, at any at any point. So. No, I think that's cool. So uh, first up, uh, let's go with uh, Martin Stewart too. Thank you. Oh, hey, let me turn the lights in here. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, in one of the first slides you mentioned, um, would this feature be added it, would this feature be accepted if it was added today? And that was mm. one of the phrases in your starting slides. I'm just curious, and maybe I'll regret asking this, would the uh, inline shaders make it today? Uh, that's funny. Well, we have plans to do a better job on them. Uh, not okay. plans, I would say, but like I've talked a lot with the people who do the WebGL stuff. And so my true dream is to... Uh, to have GLSL files be accepted by the um, compiler and have Elm style imports and have a whole import system so you can have modular GLSL code. And so I would want to take out those quasi code GLSL, but instead have a really excellent alternative. So it's something where it's like, it'd be really fun to do that. But it's hard to justify like making a change one way or the other. So yeah, that's definitely one of the things where it's like, oh, I think, I believe Markdown also used that syntax in the earliest days. So there was Markdown blocks that used that same style, and that's why there's like a special case for Markdown even till today because it was like literally in the compiler uh, at first, just because I wasn't good at making websites. <laughs> Basically, um, and if you ever look at the Elm website, uh, still it's like a lot is just markdown. That's like, um, well, hopefully that answers. Yep, thank you. <laughs> okay, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Amazing. Um, I, I had a question about uh, about Elm Studio. Uh, will be similar to something like Lambda uh, and if not, do you plan having something working on the back end with Elm? Um, well, the, the baseline idea is just to host uh, front ends, um, and hopefully that'd be attractive to people who might already have a personal website or fun side projects or companies that have this and that. Um, internally, where they can send five bucks our way. Um, and then, yeah, I'm doing a bunch of exploratory work, which I've written about on Discourse. And I want to be careful about how I talk about it, so I want to defer to the, the Discourse post for answers on the other part of the question. Um, but yeah. Sorry, it's not more satisfying. I, 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 I want to clarify, I guess. One of the things I've, through the decade working on um, Elm, I've seen, a, th there's a thing that can happen where like you get excited about something you're working on, so you share what you are going to do or what you think you're going to do. And then what you actually end up doing does or it doesn't look like that exactly. 
And so what could be a very exciting thing becomes a disappointing thing. And so I want to be conservative about what I share and be sort of strict about, you know, I've made this kind of thing and that is working and I can say, okay, I know I can incorporate that into the real compiler, but there's this other exploratory stuff. So sorry for the imprecise answer here. I hope that clarifies. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, Michael Glass. Hello. So I uh, don't have a question. I just have a comment about like, um, perhaps like a, another kind of part of the, the kind of Elm product, which mm. is many of the people who are on the Zoom call, the whatever meet call right now who have, I don't know, I know personally my, the way I think about software is like significantly be, been changed, um, not just because of the language itself, but also because of working with you and others of your disciples um, in terms of like, I think so much of um, professional career as a software developer is building the next feature. Mm -hmm. And so much of working in Elm has been, has been um, how do you make something simpler and more delightful. Um, and um, it's also kind of significantly affected my life by kind of making different homes as I, I started off in San Francisco and I moved to Berlin and the kind of the Elm communities everywhere I've been have been so nice and like curious and brought in random people like my psychologist I met at the Elm meetup because <laughs> it was a friendly language. Um, and he was like, oh, I, I want to learn about computers. Why not Elm? So, um, yeah. Anyways, I, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's like kind of the technical story. And then there's a the story of all the people that have been touched by, by you and Teresa and others. And I, I didn't mention that. I bref briefly like touched on it, like sort of the nostalgia of seeing certain names in the old posts and everything. But yeah, that's totally my experience of just like, there's so many people that it's like, I'm so lucky to have met through our projects colliding, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the, that's something I, you know, when I think about it, I feel really lucky and blessed to be working on this still 10 years later. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, great. Any other questions for Evan at this stage? Yes, Andrea, go for it. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Evan, for this talk. It was an amazing retrospective. I'm very, fairly new to Elm and everything, so it was it was insightful. I have a question about uh, Elm Studio. Hmm. I, I didn't quite get uh, the full picture, and I was wondering if it was if it's going to be more of a hosting uh, for website or something more like web, uh, WordPress.com, that kind of uh, distinction. Yeah. Thank you. I think, well, I, I wanted to introduce the idea because um, the goal is, hey, how do we make the open source compiler work sustainable long term? But the specifics are still like open to change around and we're going to shift depending on what works. So there's a version of it in our heads where it's like maybe it's actually most helpful to people teaching functional programming in college or high school and we can help them with grading and or maybe it's like you're saying more of a WordPress, more of a hosting. Um, so I think for Therese and I, we're both excited and interested in making it really easy. So I I'm hoping our niche will be more towards, you know, with AWS is the most complex and WordPress is, uh, let's say like, well, yeah, in the world of the programming part, the least complex, I don't want to call it a not complex thing. Um, more towards the WordPress side, but definitely focused on programming and like getting people to learn programming and interact with their websites that way. But like, like I said, like it, it's just an idea. The, 
thing I really wanted to express with this talk was like the big goal for the next years is how do we get that work to be sustainable and if we end up doing consulting that's okay too you know there's all sorts of paths um but i just want to start giving people a heads up of like what we're thinking about um yeah i, I hope that gives some it does yeah i i i, I understand you can not um say mu much details so i appreciate yeah i mean it's and, still it's still very early it's just like it's a we want to do that okay thank you so much and uh, mm -hmm. congratulations on uh, becoming parents oh thank you <laughs> i think that's that's one of the things you you might have missed evan we had a moment there where we couldn't see your face or anything because the messages were streaming in of congratulations but you can you can rewatch oh. that on the video recording afterwards <laughs> Okay, cool. Maybe uh, one final question, if there is one for Evan. No, great. A satiated audience. Well, that seems like a good point uh, to pause things. So um, please join me uh, again, once again, uh, in thanking Evan. Thank you, Evan. Yeah, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really cool to see so many people and so many names that I'm like, oh, yeah, this and that. Okay, great. Thanks all. See you next time.